and thanks for joining us for another episode of Tea and Trowels, the series from the Florida Public Archaeology Network, where we chat with archaeologists about their work and what archaeology means to them. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Rami Gujan, an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of West Florida. Hey, Rami, thanks for joining us. Yes. Yeah. Um, would you like to say anything else about yourself and then tell us about the mug you brought? Uh, yeah, I'm an associate professor over at the University of West Florida in the Department of Anthropology. I'm also our chapter's uh, union president, uh, and um, I'm also the president of the Florida Archaeology Council. As you know, Emily Jane, we all wear way too many hats. My mug today is one I received from my parents. Uh, they have a little bookstore up on the Blue Ridge Parkway, if you're ever that way. Uh, get off at the Little Switzerland exit in North Carolina and uh, stop in. They've got fantastic coffee, uh, which is a, a must for archaeologists, um, and a great selection of used books. Very cool. Very cool. Always good to know where all the good coffee spots and bookstores are. So yes, when yeah, by the time people get off the, the parkway there, they desperately need a cup of coffee and, uh, and usually a bathroom. Yes. The books yeah. are just... Well, I brought a mug. I was reading um, some of your research, and I was really taken by some of the um, some of the, the work you've done looking into gender roles in the past and looking at household usage and, and those kinds of things. So I brought a very typical household item, right? A coffee mug, um, and you could argue it's a pretty gendered item with eyelashes, uh, or you could argue it's not. We don't know. Um, and I would say either way, it holds probably the minimum amount of caffeine that we need to uh, have to even start to tackle some of these really hard issues of, of finding gender in the past. I also have an unusually large mug today, so for of a mind. <laughs> Excellent. So tell us a little bit about why you became an archaeologist. Um, the, the shortest version possible is that I have always wanted to do this. Um, the little bit longer version is that I had no idea that I could do this and um, almost was diverted a time or two. But I, I remember distinctly, you know, second grade, learning cursive and learning how to spell archaeology with the extra A and the weird loop together EO um, on that lined paper. Um, as a little kid, I really thought archaeology was about Egyptology. And this was probably because the, the King Tut exhibit was traveling around the U.S. in the 70s. So I was probably picking up some of that. Um, but uh, I remember in junior high, I had a, a home ec teacher who had us do a career paper, career research. And using um, the, the Federal Department of Labor Statistics, I found out what an archaeologist was making in, in the early 80s. And she wrote on my paper that I would starve to death. I would never have a family and I should look into something else, um, which is kind of ironic coming from a junior high home ec teacher. But uh, um, I did have my head turned a time or two by oceanography, environmental studies, uh, computer engineering and law. Um, and and uh, But uh, my first week of undergraduate college, I went to the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and I was in this huge lecture hall and Dr. Gary Ferraro was teaching intro to anthropology and talking about the different subfields. And as he described anthropology, I said, this is what I've been talking about doing my whole life. So I changed my major that week and um, never looked back. You know, I was just, I was shocked that I, I could actually do this thing that I was interested in. Um, I had never, it had never occurred to me that, that archaeology wasn't something that was done um, outside of a museum setting or in Egypt and that it was possibly happening all around me all the time. Uh, and, and so I was excited to see that, that there were a, a ton of different career options for me. I could study anthropology, do archaeology, and, and not starve to death, and, um, and actually make a living out of it. And the funny part is I still get to do environmental studies. Um, you know, tons of our analyses involve uh, computers and tackling different kinds of software. And uh, we are just buried up in different regulations and help helping uh, developers, for example, um, deal with with laws and regs. So, you know, the legal side is there, too. I get to do it all. 
That's, that's why I love the most about archaeology is we just like steal the best parts of all the other sciences and, and fields and like become little magpies and like compile them together to uh absolutely yeah i could go on and on house building and architecture and so my household studies are um yeah, i get to, to flex that muscle a little bit too so tell us a little bit about your research we tried to say 30 seconds but uh, i'm sure everyone's sure. like we're long-winded so <laughs> 30 seconds a minute you know um, I'll try to keep this one shorter. Uh, in your introduction, you were talking about uh, some of my recent work on uh, gender and households, and that's really been the the through current of my research is is really the archaeology of the everyday, um, the things that are seemingly kind of mundane, but that play an outsized role in basic everyday life, um, and that includes. The, the hidden things like gender relationships and status and roles, um, but also things like cooking, um, uh, the layouts of homes, um, you know, the, the, the sort of interactions that, that everyday people have with each other and their material culture and their environment. Um, that's really been the, if there was a, th a common thread through all of the work I've ever done, that's probably it. Um, I'm currently working on some sites in the Pensacola Bay area. Um, we are really trying to get a handle on what was happening here just prior to uh, the Spanish uh, colony that Luna set up, um, as well as what happened uh, with those people after contact. So a lot of it right now is just playing a little bit of archaeological catch up, trying to figure out who was where, when, um, and, and what these little small sites with shell deposits and things, what they mean in terms of how people use this region, and then their response to uh, this Spanish incursion. I think that's really one of the important things that archaeology has to offer is just that the attention that we pay to everyday objects, because like you just take everything for granted, you know, but that is so much like what you see and do every day. So much of our lives are intertwined with that. So. Yeah, I mean, archaeology, for the most part, is the accumulation of material culture, trash, but also just um, pathways and, and posts and, and places where stuff is stored that accumulate day after day after day. Like the, the rituals of the everyday creates the archaeological record. Um, and that, to me, is a little more interesting, the, the kind of anthropological question of why do we do what we do? Well, because everybody else is doing it that way too. We shape each other's behavior. And as, as, as much as we like to value the individual and the, the uni unique unicorn um, snowflake individuality of ourselves here, um, really, there's a lot of pattern behavior and that, that just gets played out every single day. Um, and that's what we're really teasing apart when, we, when we're we're excavating. It's oftentimes just the, the accumulated repetitive actions of people. So what's your favorite tool in your toolkit when you go and look for some of these things? Um, I had a hard time with this one. I, I wanted to show off a fancy trial, but I figure everybody, you know, that one's been covered. Everybody's got their favorite trial. Um, and uh, I, I narrowed it down to one tool that I use on occasion in the lab. And this is a profile tool. This is something you can pick up in the hardware store. It's meant for measuring things like crown molding. If you look, boop. Um, if you press it into the crown molding, you can get the, the profile of your, your particular molding and take it to the, the hardware store and, and match it up with what they've got. Um, in, in earlier times, it was used to get the profile so that you could then um, use a tool to create your own molding that matches what's currently in your house. As an archaeologist, I use it to measure things like the profiles of rim sherds. And so by pressing it into the sherd, I get a quick and dirty impression of the rim. And this can help us do things like analyze what the vessel was used for, how large it was. Um, uh, it helps us draw the profiles. If we've only got a portion of the vessel, it helps us draw the profile so then we can um, measure the shape of it or, or, or suss out what the actual shape of the whole vessel was. 
So my little profile tool is uh, one of my favorite things to have laying around the lab. It's one of those, it's, it's like the, the, they make the toys that you can like put your hand in. It's like the archeology span version of that toy. Right? <laughs> the 2D version of the big nail bed. Very cool. Um, do you have a best worst field story that you can now laugh about that you would like to share? Oh, uh, so many. I spent a long time doing cultural resource management and did infinite number of surveys. Um, but uh, two very closely spaced projects come to mind. Uh, in August of 2001, I had just started with a new company and they sent me out on a survey in uh, Oconee County, uh, Georgia. And I wanted to impress the, this crew I'd been assigned and uh, you know, take charge right off the bat. And so I uh, got out inside of the highway and I stuck my shovel in the ground and kind of pushed it forward and put the map across it and, you know, ordered, you go over there and you go over there and here's your intervals and we're going to go this far and then we're going to turn around and regroup and, you know, gave their marching orders. And then I pulled that shovel back to release all of the bees that I had just skewered and, and entrapped. And, um, they were very sneaky about it. They got up my pants and up my shirt before they decided to act. And so my brand new crew, brand new colleagues saw me streaking down 441 in the rain, tearing off my clothes and flailing myself as the truck drivers were honking and waving at me. And so uh, uh, after that first exciting day, uh, every time we got near any kind of bees, they could sense the pheromones covering me and attack me again. I was stung dozens of times that first day. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that project also, I was given the wrong set of maps. And so we surveyed several miles in addition to the short part we were supposed to do and finished it in the normal amount of time. But the crew came back, um, you know, a little bit impressed that I had flogged them through the woods at that pace and a little bit pissed that I had uh, didn't realize I'd been given the wrong maps and we, we did twice as much work as we were supposed to. That's, that's a pretty good story. Bees do not mess around. Uh, yeah, insects, crazy. Um, well, our big question here, uh, how do you think archeology span can help save the world? Oh, um, this is a, something that I try to convey to my students. Like we receive pushback sometimes as archeologists, I'm sure historians get the same sort of thing. Like what good to present day society um, does studying the past get us? And, and the little secret I try to convey is that we're not really only asking questions about the past. We're asking questions that are important to us. Um, I can't imagine spending a career asking, interrogating the past in a way that doesn't interest me at all. Like, I, I can't even conceive of questions I would want to spend decades of my life studying if I didn't have some kind of real interest to me now. So my interest in households and gender and everyday life is reflecting some kind of, um, you know, a, a psychologist could have a field day with me, but, you know, some kind of questions or burning questions I'm interested in about my own daily life and, and gender relationships and things like that. Um, so the questions that we need answered now um, can also be answered by looking at how people responded to environmental disasters, um, political upheaval and turmoil, um, rising sea levels, you know, you name it. We can ask questions that are, that are terribly important to the present day and, and see how uh, people handled these same problems in the past. So archeology span can, can definitely inform um, our decision-making uh, about the future. It's like the best and also most frustrating challenge that I think a lot of us probably got in grad school in those like intro to anthropological thought or archeology span theory classes where there's always just that pushback of like, but are we really learning about the past or are we just learning about ourselves? And in some ways it's always both. So. Yeah. And the other spin I put on it is it's job security. You know, we will always, there may come a day where we've run out of sites. You know, 
it's it's maybe in the future not too terribly far down the road but we can always ask new questions about older collections and older sites like we'll never never run out of things to ask about because it really is just about us we'll keep making new sites archaeology is very self-centered you know it's all about me really this is what i'm interested in and i don't really uh care what the past conclusions were about this i'm going to ask a new set of questions yes well we have one bonus question for you uh what's been keeping you sane lately <laughs> that assumes that i'm still sane uh no, I'm using this summer out of the field to catch up on some reports and things like that. And so um, one of the things I'm doing to try to keep myself from going stir crazy is uh, I've been, I picked up the ukulele lately. Um, that's been kind of fun. And um, doing a lot of biking. Uh, when it's not pouring down rain over here in Pensacola. Uh, and definitely riding bikes is a great way to sort through some argument um or or part of a paper that i'm just stumbling on if i pack it all in my head and then take it out on the road for an hour um it it helps me to sort out what it is i'm really trying to say and it also helps stave off the uh earworms and just terrible 80s songs that'll get stuck in my head while i'm biking you know i find sometimes thinking about the past and gender relationships um keeps george michael and wham from creeping into my head while i'm pedaling I don't know. I feel like they could also contribute to the conversation about gender <laughs> relations. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the heat, or the humidity or something, but I get the worst earworms when I'm riding my bike. I'm like, please let me think about the past. Please let some archaeological problem come along or a swarm of bees or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun. Well, uh, thanks for joining us and thanks to everyone for watching at, uh, watching along at home. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.